Welcome back. We're in the middle of our series on how to set up and adjust your car. Today we're going to be doing something a little bit different. Um, Abby's off at school today, so I don't have my helper. It's just me. Um, we're going to be talking about some changes that you may want to make to your car based on how it's how it's acting on the track and, and what you need to think about um, in certain parts of the corner. Again, like I've, like I've prefaced many before, this is just one way of doing things. This is how I like to oversimplify things and, and think about myself um, when I'm at the track. We've mentioned before how important records are. One of, one of my mentors, a former boss of mine, whom, whom I have a lot of respect for, he always used to say, fail to plan, plan to fail. This is, tr this is true in life, but it's true in racing uh, as much as anything else. With that in mind, before we get into changes and, and what your car is doing, you need to make sure that you have a set of track notes for every track you go to. This is, these are my notes for, for VIR. I keep, I keep a hard copy in my race folder. I also have them in electronic form on my phone. These are about 14 pages long and they're broken down by corners. So I know what I'm aiming for. I know what I'm trying to get the car to do. So if it's not doing what I'm aiming for, then I, then I can make some changes as necessary. But I'm not clear on what I'm asking the car to do in a corner. It's going to be even more unclear as to what changes I need to make in order to get the car to, to work better through that corner or the track. So let's, let's go ahead and get into it. Stay tuned at the end of the video. We, we're going to be having a, a giveaway on some track notes for VIR. So stay tuned for more information on that. We may have to go handheld here for a little bit, but I'm going to try and run through this first and just kind of get you through some of the some of the oversimplifications of, of what I prioritize when I'm setting a car up. This is just a basic 90 degree corner. We're not going to get into increasing, decreasing radiuses. We're not going to get into camber changes, uh, pavement changes, that sort of stuff. All that really affects your racing line. But this is more what what changes I like to think about when I'm when I'm approaching my setup. I like to to start my setup just like I would start the corner. I like to start in the braking zone. My priority as far as setup goes in the braking zone, I give priority to ride height and then I, I use whatever spring rate I need to to get to achieve the ride height I'm looking for. Again, this gets a little bit into roll centers. To oversimplify it, when I'm heavy on the brakes, I would like my, my nose or the frame of my car to just graze the ground in, in my heaviest of braking. With that said, I want to use the springs, particularly in the front, that allow that ride height. So, so in my experience, lower is almost always better. So I, I set my front springs. I use my rear springs to complement the front springs and get, get the balance that I want there. Okay, and my rudimentary figures, as you can see right here, the tires we're using, um, the bigger the tire, the more load that's on that tire. Red represents braking. So we really are looking at the front two tires when we're braking in a straight line. Yes, the rear has an effect, but unless something's really askew, you're going to get the biggest bang for your buck making the changes up front if you have an issue here. Now, I've got, there's a, there's a turn in point right here, and then there's kind of a, a point A, and there's point B here. I don't know if you can see that, and then we'll, we'll go in toward the apex here. At turn in here, I like, we're still on the brakes, what I like to think of 
helps at this point is Ackerman. If you can get, generally speaking, the more Ackerman you can get there, the better. Many of our cars, that's not adjustable. Other cars were designed without Ackerman in mind. Uh, con concepts have changed. What Ackerman is and what it allows us to do is it allows us to run our tires much, much more parallel on the straightaways. But the second we turn our steering wheel, in this example, a right-hand corner, the inside wheel is going to turn more than the outside wheel will. So it, it in effect gives you tow out when you turn the steering wheel. It used to be thought of that this was primarily a benefit in low speed corners. Most every street car has, has a lot of Ackerman built into it. Um, and in our cars, it seems to be a benefit just about everywhere. Ackerman, we'll, we'll get into this in, in another video, but if you could imagine the a line drawn from the ball joint, your, your caster angle, basically, but the ball joints, the center of the ball joints to the center of the outer tie rod, so the steering link there, and you draw that straight back to where they intersect with the chassis center line when the, when the wheel is straight ahead. Again, no Ackerman, they wouldn't intersect. They would be parallel. On my car, I've got them to where they, they come back and they intersect right at the, the timing mark in the, in the bell housing there. So it is forward of the rear axle. Think of the, the center point of the rear axle, the differential as, as rotation of the car. So forward of that, it's, it's going to point in a little bit better. So if you can't adjust your Ackerman, uh, think toe out, more toe out generally speaking, will we'll help with this point in and help the car take a set a little bit better. Okay, that's, that's from turn in to point A when you, when you plan on really releasing the brakes. You, I've got a little dotted line here of, of red and blue. Blue is when you're really not on the gas or the brake. Um, and red, you're kind of trailing off the brakes. If your car's having an issue in this area or you want to refine it, what I like to think of is our sway bars and our brake pad compound. Um, different brake pads have different release characteristics. Find a brake pad that suits your driving style, not just for how it bites, but also how it releases. The, the treads are a little less forgiving than slick tires in this manner. And so this is really how you can kind of milk the last bit of speed out of them. Um, and, and getting, you can see our tires here, getting the load to shift over to what this is and be primarily on your outside tires. This is really, you want it to be a fluid process and you don't want to be real jerky in, in this aspect because you're going to scrub a lot of speed. If you're having trouble in this area, one, one thing to look at is look at a lot of uh, underpowered uh, oval track guys. Not everybody's cup of tea. Most days it's not mine. They do a really good job of carrying their momentum and speed into a corner. So there's something to be learned from everything. Watch those guys, even if they're front wheel drive, you'll, you'll notice a lot of driving characteristics and then uh, a lot in how they uh, manipulate their car through there. The reason I the reason I sw uh, specify sway bars here is our load is primarily front rear here. Well, now we're inducing some roll to the car, so the balance of the front and rear bar is going to determine a lot in how your car oversteers, understeers, uh, loses speed in this area, that sort of stuff. I tend to set my car up to be as stiff on my front bar and stiff in the front bar if you've got an adjustment, right up until I, I, I oversteer and this doesn't work. When I do that, I come a little softer. I then use my rear bar as my primary adjustment at the racetrack. 
and I get the happy balance that I want. Once we've trailed all the way off the brakes here, we're going to be primarily in lateral, lateral force here. So in this example, we right hand turn, we'd be putting the load on our left hand tires. That's what we really need to think about. Again, sway bars and spring rates. What's, what's the balance of your front and rear here? And how well is that keeping the car pointed toward the apex? Again, we don't want to do a lot of changing of, of direction back and forth here. We're, at that point, we're scrubbing a lot of speed that we used the straightaway for um, and hopefully didn't, didn't over scrub on our brakes. We're going to be, I've got some acceleration here before our throttle pickup, before the apex here. Our cars are underpowered. Sometimes they take a little bit of time to kind of wind up and get, get ahead of steam going. That's really what that is there. From here on out, as you can see, I have a whole lot less notes. If you get this right, the track out should somewhat take care of itself. I find a well-balanced car going into the apex is a well-balanced car coming out of the apex. Oftentimes, people are concerned about this. They totally screw this up, and this really doesn't matter because they haven't, they haven't kept their minimum speed high, all that sort of stuff. Again, you can see we're using our left, left side tires here, but the load is also transitioning to the back, so we're also starting to put some load on the right rear tire. I'm primarily thinking of shocks or, or rear settings once I get out to here. Once you get to track out your, your drag racer, uh, NASCAR racer, you know, pin the throttle down, utilize your drafting, time your moves, that sort of stuff. To break this down and, and even over, oversimplify it from there, braking zone before the apex, think front suspension. Your front tires are really going to be doing most of the work. You're going to get the most bang for your buck going to the front setups first. And then, and then think of the rear setup from there. The rear would be secondary. Coming out of the apex toward track out, think rear suspension. Again, the load's going to be there. Not that the front isn't important. It's just you're not going to get as much bang for your buck there. So we're going to shift over here. Um, I'm probably going to go handheld for this one here in a little bit. But let me, let me kind of oversimplify this. And use your tires. Use all of your tires. One of the things with the treaded tire is because we have these grooves in here, the rubber can't move all the way across the tire and the heat can't really move consistently all the way across the tire. You've got these uh, stop gaps in there. So one thing to note, particularly when a lot of guys are coming over from slicks, sometimes they'll have a lot more negative camber. This is what too much negative camber looks like. If this is the outside of your tire and the inside here, so the tire would be pointed like this, center line of the vehicle is here. The tire would be cambered in like this. You'll notice when you come off the track, you'll have graining or, or scuffing of the tires. You'll get a little rolled up lip on the inside here and it'll look pretty consistent. You may get some build ups right around the grooves. That's, that's okay. It'll look pretty consistent. And then the outside of the tire here looks brand new. It's not even scuffed in. You're not using all your tire. You've paid for it. It's, it's a spec tire. It's all you got. Make sure you're using it. What I like to do is I would then stand my tire up a little bit more. So let's say that we're negative three quarters of a degree here, I would stand it up to negative a quarter of a degree and see what that looks like. If you notice when you come in from a session and your tires are hot and you've got this graining a little lip over here and the graining looks pretty consistent and it comes real nice and close to this outside edge, you're using, you're using all the tires you've got. That's, that's really pretty close on your, on your camber setup as far as that goes. Um, 
a lot of guys use parameters um, and, and have had luck with them. I've used them. I, I find it can help, particularly as, as tire pressure goes. Our tires are very hard, a very hard compound. I, I find that I, by the time I've come into the pits and even if I've got somebody checking it there, it, it gets very hard to get a, get enough data there to to really be helpful for me. So I've found that using this this graining example tends to be what gets me really close on my setup. Hopefully this will work for you too. Um, I said at the end there we, we would be having a a little bit of a giveaway on the track notes. VIR is about a month away. If you haven't been, it's a, it's a world-class facility. For the next five entries that confirm it and send us a message, we'll, we'll recheck on, uh, registrate on the online registration and give me your email address. I will send you an electronic copy of our notes for the next five that are entered in round one of the Formula Ford Challenge Series 2019. I hope you found these useful. We will, we will be doing some more technical videos, particularly uh, getting your car ready for tech and ready for the track, some safety things and what to check. Thanks for tuning in. And if you found these useful, please like, give them a thumbs up or comment below and tell us, tell us how we're doing. Tell us some videos you'd like to see. Thanks. All right, I know that's, that demonstration was a little hard to see it from where from where the camera was, so I figure I'd give you all a little bit of a close-up look. Maybe the colors will come up a little better, and we'll do a little clarification on the Akron. Again, this is this red represents the brake zone. You can see the front tires are heavily loaded here. We're trailing off the brakes right here. You've got a, you've still got some force on the right front tire. Left front is taking most of it, and the left rear is starting to come into play there as well. Again, the the movement you would be shifting this way. Okay. Now from here, you're basically not not touching the throttle or the brake, and you really are trying to transition the force to go full lateral as far as that stuff goes. Excuse me. Here you would have the force going this in a vector this way and you would want it to continue to go that way back here after the apex you want the force vector to be changing again about another 45 degrees but this is hopefully this is a little clearer on the visual part of it we talked about the Ackerman a little bit and forgive my uh, lack of artistic ability these circles right here are the ball joints. You've got your A-arms, spring, that may or may not be your setup. This is a top view of the left front side. So here's the caliper, the rotor, the wheel studs, your wheel would bolt on here. This is where the steering arm is. So some cars it's in front, some cars it's behind. What the Ackerman is, is if you drew a center line uh, from the top and lower ball joint, Okay, and made this a plane like this, and then connected where your your steering tie rod bolts there. Draw a straight line from this center point to the intersection of those center points. Draw a straight line, you'd continue it back to where it intersects with the center line of the chassis, and that would be your Ackerman. Again, if this was moved over here with this center line, that line would be going this direction, so you wouldn't have any Ackerman at all. A little bit closer view of that tire demonstration. The rolled up, rolled up edges here, that's normal. But if you're not getting this graining pattern all the way to the outside edge and your outside tire looks fresh, bad outside of the treaded area if the tire looks fresh, you're you've got too much negative camber dialed in. Um, likewise, the opposite would be true. If you had too much positive camber, I don't know why you would have that, but maybe you decided to bolt these on a pre-war car. And um, if you got too much positive and this isn't rubbing, you got some major other issues going on. 
this is what this is what you'd like it to look like very consistent across the inside is going to have realistically some more graining and usage than the outside that's that's normal that's fine the biggest thing is you just want to make sure that that graining or scrub goes as far toward the outside edge as you can get it if you're getting too heavy right here or too much of a lip over here either your tire pressure is too low um, or you you need to dial a little bit less a little bit more negative or less camber into the into the particular suspension so hope that's